So my name is Gemma Carney and I'm talking to you today about some research that I've undertaken with my colleague Paula Devine and Katrina Lloyd was also involved in this research. But Paula and I are um, very, very busy working on something called the ARC Ageing Programme and it's really embedding uh, knowledge and research evidence about ageing and older people in Northern Ireland. And one of the things we did, which is one of the most fun things that we've done over the last three years, is to ask the uh, 10 and 11 year olds living in Northern Ireland, what do they think about ageing? What do they think about their own ageing and what do they think about older people in general? So hopefully this won't let me down now. Okay, so this is what I'm going to talk about today, which is kind of um, a general question about why we need to talk about population change. So there's lots and lots of talk about it. Every day in the news you'll hear something about dementia, time bombs or health and social care crisis. But there's much, much bigger reasons as to why we should look at population change. I'm going to explain to you our methods and approach. And then I'm going to show you what really... I, I could have given seven different presentations on the data we had. These children were so articulate. But one thing we asked them to do was to... Um, we asked them open-ended questions. What do you think your life would be like at 40? What do you think your life would be like at 70? So I'm going to share with you some of their um, uh, really quite de detailed visualisations that they gave us... Um, in the survey. I'm also going to talk a little bit about general issues around respect for older people and how we think about ageism and the root cause of ageism, age segregation. And I'm going to make an argument about that and link it in to the Northern Ireland policy context. So not too much to do in 20 minutes. I'm just going to pop out of this for a second because I want to show you some data from the United Nations. So this is the UK population. This is the population pyramid that we talk about. So um, this is what it was like in 1966. So if you look at this graph, you can see very few people over the age of 80, more children than there are older people. Let's look at it today. Big change. This pyramid is becoming a rectangle. Now this is happening all over the world, but I'm, I'm concentrating on the UK. But basically what's happening is you can see there's more people living right up to the age of 100 and more. If you notice there as well, slightly more women than men live up to that age. And the big change, and why I'm talking about what children think about old age is, if you look at the bottom there, there are far fewer children than there used to be in proportion to the rest of the population. So the reason I wanted to show you those graphs, which wouldn't embed in the thing for some reason, is because um, so often we talk about population ageing and population change, and we talk about it in terms of people living longer. But in fact, it's about the change in that pyramid. It's about the whole demographic balance shifting. And actually, it isn't just about thinking about having policies for older people and spending more on health and social care. It's really thinking about how are we going to manage this fundamental shift, particularly in terms of relationships between different age groups, between different generations, and how are we going to avoid having a situation where when the inevitable happens, when we have to redistribute resources in favour of whichever population needs more public services, how are we going to make sure that there, aren't, there isn't discord between the generations when we do that? And one of the things that uh, family sociologists and people who study ageing from a life course perspective, so they study it from uh, birth right up to death, is that one of the problems is we live in a very age-segregated world. And this means that there aren't many opportunities for us to interact with people outside our own age group other than uh, within the family. So chronological age is actually used all the time in policy making. We really don't think about it. But actually, schools are for children. Education is seen as an investment for the future. We have a whole long period, some of us would say it's too long, particularly at the stage I'm at, where you're working. And that is a very, very long period of, from the age of about 20 up until 70 now. And we have this idea of having a pension, that period when you're on a pension, a period when you are an older person and you're outside the labour market. So um, leading researchers call that the segmented life course. But what we don't do, so we have an idea that we do have this problem that we... It's kind of common sense to organise things around age, but actually there are unintended consequences to doing that and there can be problems with it. What we don't do, though, while we do maybe address the problems with work-life work balance and things like that, we don't look at the relationship between that cohort at the bottom of the pyramid and those at the very top. We tend to kind of forget about what Gunhild Hagestad has called the bookend generations. So that's why it was really important for us to do this small piece of research to ask children what do they think about old age? 
How do they imagine their future at 40 and at 70? So it was a Kids Life and Time survey. 2,312 10 and 11-year-olds were asked extra questions on top of the survey they were already doing about um, ageing and older people. We wanted to find out when do they think old age begins. And it was interesting, actually, that um, Mr... What was his name? Michael Naff, was it? Yeah. Michael Duff, who we introduced it, said that as you get older, actually, uh, 70 doesn't look so old. And that certainly seems to be the case uh, when you start asking children about when old age begins. Um, we wanted to find out as well about whether they have this vision of the segmented life course, whether they have this idea that I'll be working at 40, I'll be retired at 70. And we wanted to see if there was any evidence of ageism. Did they see older people as something that was negative? or some kind of outgroup thinking along the lines of what Steffi was talking about in terms of race. So we thought this survey would be a good place to start in terms of getting an evidence base in terms of the generational contact that we do have. So does anybody want to have a guess what age do they think, do you think that the 10 year olds thought old age begins? Thirty. <laughs> the lowest one was thirty. The mean was 54, but quite a number of them said they didn't know. They were quite confused by it. But you have to see a couple of quotes here from the open-ended responses. One of them said, I think of them as old when they're 48, so I'm sorry if you're 48. And then some very uh, emotionally intelligent children, I don't think of them as old people. I think of them as people who have lasted longer. So they did really have, right through the whole survey, and I did a, I've written a paper all about the responses, the, open, the responses to the open-ended questions. So I did kind of a qualitative analysis of a large number of these questions. And I was really amazed by what uh, the children expressed in terms of you know, generational intelligence. They could really understand uh, and, and imagine what it was like to be um, an older person. They were very keen that older people should be respected. They kind of could see that this was a value that was worth having in society. Um, but what was interesting, and it came up a number of different times in different ways, is that the group that they thought suffered ageism the most is teenagers. And, you know, when you think about it, there, there's definitely something in that. that the, many of them, they were on the cusp of becoming teenagers, and they were really dreading it. So, as I said, we wanted to see whether they think that they are going to move through this segmented life course, are they going to be aware of what they'll be doing at 40 and 70, and do they see it as work and retirement? Well, this is what they said in terms of life at 40. Basically, they thought it was all going to be all about work, but it depends on the work you're doing, of course. One of them said that he would be at NASA training to be an astronaut going to the moon. This person came up quite a lot. A number of the boys Hundreds of the boys said footballer. And doesn't that come up quite often in terms of the kids' life and time survey? Uh, but children seem to be really aware that the, at the age of 40, it would be all about career. That they would be really, really busy. That they would have many, many multiple roles. And that these roles would be public. So that there wouldn't be any escaping from them. They would be work and looking after their family. When it comes to 70, actually, they seem to be looking forward to retirement. And it was all about enjoying life. And they had some lovely uh, words they put on how they saw this. Uh, and they, they saw it as a, a period of deserved recline. So they said things like sitting on a green armchair with a waistcoat and black shoes, watching the television all fit and well. <laughs> they were also very keen to describe that they would be at home. So they seemed to have this clear sense that they were no longer out there working they were now going to be back in the house. So they kept referring to home. And at first, when I was analysing it, I was thinking, are they talking about care homes? But no, they weren't, because it was nothing to do with care. It was to do with retreating back into the domestic sphere. So it seems that they have this uh, idea that they will have to be out there earning the money. Boys and girls both thought this when they're in their 40s. But there's a chance then to have a simpler life as you get older. Living with my husband, children and grandchildren visiting me every weekend. And then one child who's not feeling that they're ever going to be able to give up work. The law won't let you retire till you're 67. Very up-to-date knowledge. Um, so by the time I'm 67, the number will have increased, so probably still working. This person is probably right. And probably will end up working here in policy. Um, 
And as I said, they had really detailed visualizations of the future. There was a little gender difference in this, in that the girls tended to have a bit more detail in terms of their visualization. And the biggest difference was in terms of seeing life at 40 and 70. And this was interesting. They were able to give much more detail about how the, what they thought they'd be doing at 40. And of course, that makes sense because their parents are probably about that age. So one of them said, I believe I will have a fairly good job, hopefully a scientist, be living in a good house, still taking life by the hand. I believe you're only as old as you feel. <laughs> Isn't it so uplifting that these, this is Northern Ireland in the future? Much, much less detail at 70. But there were a couple of things that came out that I really wanted to, um, to link into this idea of age segregation and how some researchers can see this as... It's not that it's um, harmful in an overt sense, but it's more that it kind of leads to a set of relationships that doesn't let, mean that everybody's able to reach their full potential. And one of the things that came out was that the children said, what you, when you said what you think you'd be doing at 70, they actually described life at 70 as fantastic. They said you'd be free, you'd be able to drive your car, you'd have your own money, you would have, um, live in your own house. And actually, this is a good point, because we were looking at old age, and we tend to from a midlife perspective, but from a child's perspective, in comparison with being 10, older people have loads of freedom and autonomy. And it actually really does tie in, when I looked into it, with uh, the broader literature around children's lives now, that they are very protected, that their parents are making all the decisions. And one of the things that could be worth looking at in terms of breaking down age segregation is that actually there's evidence to show that grandparents are a bit more relaxed. Grandparents are a little bit more lax as babysitters and could actually give children a little bit more freedom. So that'll be one thing about having an older population that will be an advantage. Excuse me. Now... The other thing, I want to link it back into some of this bigger argument about um, age segregation. And one of the things that is quite clear from what the children said is that really they are observing other generations mainly through their family contact. So if you don't have uh, a three or four generation family, you're not going to get that sense to know older people. And we know from our experience here in Northern Ireland, that when you do separate people, you're going to create conditions that will lead to people not understanding each other as well as they could. So actually, one of the things the children said was that it would be good to have more intergenerational contact. But again, they said, it's the teenagers that are actually suffering ageism. So they actually thought the 70-year-olds were doing great and that it was the 17-year-olds the that were really having a harder time. So back to the policy context then here in Northern Ireland, we have two different, we've lots of different strategies, but the two that are most relevant are the active ageing strategy and the children and young people strategy. And this is just another example to show you how we do really have silos in terms of policy making, when in fact there's a whole way of looking at how we move through life, which is this third way, which takes account of cohort and generation which looks at chronological age as, yes, a useful way of defining and designing policy, but also potentially problematic if you start to pit one generation against the other. So in fact, if we were to take a life course approach in designing policy, we would be aware of things like childhood deprivation actually leading to problems of health in old age. Lack of investment in children's education is what then leads to them having not such good outcomes later in life. And in fact, even life expectancy itself is very clearly linked into the kind of investment that is made in person as a child. So we need to start seeing older people as children of the past. We need to start seeing ch the current generation of children as our future older generation. And to start to be much more creative about our ageing population, instead of just seeing it as a problem of older people. So there are some good examples of um, how we can work creatively together, and I'll just flick across to that. There's a particularly good group called Linking Generations, Northern Ireland, uh, who Paula and I have done a bit of work with, Lynn Johnston there, and they have, they actually started as one of these cross-community, community safety projects. They then got um, taken on board by the Beth Johnson Foundation, which runs all over the UK, and now what they do is they started by just linking generations within 
uh, deprived communities that were already segregated. But now they have lots of different uh, initiatives, including bringing older people into schools and providing opportunities for Northern Ireland to become an age-friendly place, a place where generations can work together and where you can build a community that is uh, suitable for all ages. So that concludes my talk. And are we having questions afterwards? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you.